everyone, and welcome back to ACC Senior Services. My name is Danny Lee, and I am the Lifelong Learning and Wellness Program Manager here at ACC. And we are so excited today to have Christine Hunter here to talk about her book, We Can Do This. And so some of you might be new to ACC actually. And so um, I just wanted to welcome you here. We have a variety of different services and that includes memory care, assisted and independent living. And we also have lots of different programs here including our rides and our senior escort program, our friendly companion program. So a ton of different resources. And if you're interested, please visit accsv.org. And also, if you're interested in looking at any of our other future presentations, we have different cooking demos and exercise classes. That would be the same website slash online. Now, I want to get into why we have Chris here. So we just want to mention the people and stories that are in Chris's book, and it really parallels ACC's history. The book covers women trailblazers in Sacramento politics from 1972 all the way to 2014. And actually, 1972 was the year ACC was founded by community activists in the Chinese and Japanese communities. And that includes many strong women that ACC highlighted, highlighted in the last episodes of the ACC History Project. Now, 1972 was a very restless time, but from our earliest days, people in and around City Hall and the Board of Supervisors have helped ACC in the areas of community organizing, fundraising, and also getting buy-in for some of our most ambitious projects, including the ACC Nursing Home. Now, former supervisor Isla Collin is here with us today in the audience along with her husband, Don. And we're so happy to have her here along with Jean Shiyamoto, our chair of the board at ACC. And we also would like to mention former mayors Ann Rudin and Heather Fargo, who is also here with us today. Among the gentlemen that we want to also mention and that comes to mind when we're talking about ACC history is council member Robert Matsui, former mayor Phil Eisenberg. And we also just want to talk about Mayor Jimmy Yi, who's also been on our previous ACC history projects and have all championed ACC for decades. It's because of these connections to our political leaders that ACC is really looking forward to Chris's talk today. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chris Hunter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Danny and uh, the ACC for hosting this event today. Um, it's just a, just a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, I'd also like to thank Isla Collin for being here, and a particular note, former Mayor Heather Fargo and former City Council Representative Lauren Hammond are participating, and we hope that the audience will become engaged and ask questions, if it's possible, about your experiences being in politics and generally a woman in Sacramento. Um, the, the, this book is a product of, of, of great love. The original originally started when I, this is in the before times, when we used to have luncheons. Most of the time we had lunches together at plates, and we called ourselves the grannies. A lot of the women who attended those luncheons, including Ida Collin and Heather Fargo, are in the book, most of them. Um, I looked around the room one day when we were having lunch, and I said, this is a dynamite group of women. And so I started the research and the interviews and so forth to get the book underway. Um, I also uh, would like to hand it over to Heather to make a few comments right now. Sure. Uh, well, I helped to write the, the last chapter of the book and I need to start by really thanking Chris Hunter for doing years of interviews uh, and work to, to write the book, to think about how to, how to lay it out in a way that was interesting, uh, educational, but also fun. Um, I think it's a good read and I really want to uh, encourage people to get a copy of it if they can. I helped to write the last chapter because I wanted us to look at moving forward and what, uh, what's going to come next. 
how do we encourage women to run for office in the future? Uh, how do we help them prepare? Um, who do we want to see running and why? And uh, what organizations are out there to help them? So that was sort of my thinking behind that last chapter. Uh, but mostly I want to thank Chris for getting us all together to actually finally write her story and not just history. Um, and, and really tell the story of a very dynamic time in Sacramento's history, uh, which is still affecting our, our current lives here in Sacramento. Thank you. And in addition to thanking Heather and Lauren, I also want to mention all of the people who had contributed to this project. This is definitely not a lone project. I had help from other writers, researchers. Our book formatter and designer did a beautiful job. If you see the book behind me, that painting on the book, it actually is a play on former uh, city councilwoman uh, uh, Kim Mueller. And it's, it's got some whimsical references in the painting, and I also got great help from our designer, Vanessa Perez, and editors, the League of Women Voters, in fact, launched this book. And this is the point where I want to also mention that all of the proceeds from the sale of this book will be donated to the Ann Rudin Scholarship Fund. As many of you may recall, Ann recently died on, sadly, on Thanksgiving Day, this last Thanksgiving. And uh, we all miss her, and we miss her contributions to the city. But we're also looking forward to younger women coming up. And that's why I decided to donate all proceeds to the scholarship fund. These are the women who will make a difference in our future, and we need to help bring them up. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today as well. Uh, my name is Lori Hensley, and I had the great pleasure of working with Chris on editing the book. Um, I'm lucky enough to know many of the women profiled, and it was tremendous pleasure to read more about them and help, help get uh, the book to its final form so that you can also read it. Um, Chris, I think you touched on this, what, what spurred you to write this book, but maybe you can expand on that a little bit and talk about some of the women who were an inspiration to you. Well, one of the women, I think we should have some of the first photographs now. One of the women, of course, who influenced me was my mother. Uh, a lot of the women in the book came up through the League of Women Voters, including my mother, Joanne Long. We're going to go back. To oh, we've the lost, first photo. we lost the first photo. <laughs> uh, anyway, while, while the photo is, is being uh, explored or been brought up, my mother was the president of the League of Women Voters in 1959 and 60. And this is a photograph of her uh, wearing a jet, fighter jet uh, uh, jumpsuit. She's with a handsome fighter pilot. And one of the perks back then in, the, in 1960 was women leaders were taken on flights over the city to see how things looked. And my mother, always one for adventure, really relished this opportunity. Mm -hmm. She was a, a leader. She was one of the women who, in the late 50s, helped organize the drive, the annexation drive, to bring Sutterville Heights into Sacramento. So of course, she was my inspiration. Often we don't realize how much our mothers are our inspiration until we look back. That same year, 1960, she chose to divorce. And back then, it was a terrible, terrible life if you were a woman divorced and trying to maintain your family. She moved from relative prosperity, comfort, to having to really scratch a living. And so I now realize how courageous she was and steadfast, and she always retained her sense of humor. And we can move on to the next photograph. So Isla, this is Isla, I think in about 1972. One of, the, uh, one of the portions of the book that I think are, is very illuminating is the portion of the book that talks about the difficulty of women finding childcare in the 70s. There was very little licensed childcare, and Isla was among many who found childcare a challenge. Uh, what was happening in the league back then is they were sort of a refuge for women coming up. Uh, they would pr pr provide childcare for each other, and uh, a number of women found that as a, a true refuge, including our former mayor, Anne Rudin. She found uh, the, the League as a source to get stimulated intellectually and also get, got childcare while she uh, enjoyed her the camaraderie of her friends. 
So we could have the next photo. And of course, this is Anne Rudin. I believe this is when she was mayor. I think it was about 1984. And quite a lot is devoted to Anne, including how women lead. Uh, there's a section in the book about that, and we can go into that in more detail uh, later on. But she found it a very challenging situation when she was first elected to city council in 1971. It was the, the year that uh, we had switched in Sacramento from citywide elections to district elections. And she, like so many women in this book, seized the moment that uh, she could become active and become a leader and ran for office way before other women were doing so. I think Isla probably ran in 72 initially. I could be wrong. but um, So she ran, she got elected, and then she found when she got to the city hall, the guys around the table expected her to make coffee. No, she did not. <laughs> so there is a, a great deal devoted to challenges like that, uh, expectations, and how women lead. Could we have another photo? And this is Kim Mueller, who is pictured in that book to, to, to my left. Uh, that's sort of a whimsical play on her holding up her campaign shoes. Uh, when I, Anne ran and when Isla ran and the women who became really uh, prominent, in fact, at one point there were five members of the city council who were women, and that was like a wonderful period. Anyway, Kim, one of the youngest to run for office, is holding up her victory shoes from campaigning, doing precinct walking, and the role of precinct walking and how women uh, got themselves elected is another important part of the book. Next photo. This one is uh, uh, a trip that Anne Rudin and Isla Cowan took to a sitter city. I think it's Jinan in, Jinan. Jinan in China. There's a good story about um, the chair that Richard Nixon sat in. I won't tell you the story. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> OK, next photo. Well, I'd like to turn this over to Heather, and hopefully we get to hear from Lauren soon. But uh, Heather, if you could talk about this photo, and we'll get, get this away from me. <laughs> OK. Well, believe it or not, the young woman in the middle of that picture is me. Uh, and I was standing uh, with, I believe it was Lila Hansen, Ann Rudin, uh, and Lynn Roby. And we were giving Lynn Roby an award uh, as she was leaving the council. And that is a uh, League of Women Voters luncheon. They used to hold luncheons here in Sacramento. Uh, that it was one of the events to go to, the, the room filled at the community center. Uh, and it was a state of the community event. And so what we did is we talked both about the state of the city as well as the state of the county. Uh, and it was so we had both the supervisors there um, as well as the city council of Sacramento. And that was before the, the new cities were formed, before Elk Grove and Citrus Heights and Rancho Cordoba became cities. Um, and so at that time, the only other cities were Folsom, Isleton, and Galt, which were fondly called the fig cities um, for Folsom, Isleton, and Galt. So, but this picture uh, was us at this luncheon, and we were just celebrating uh, Lynn's contributions to the city of Sacramento. Uh, when I first got elected in 1989, I became the fifth woman on the city council, and that was the, it lasted for two years, and that was the one and only time that the city of Sacramento ever had a female majority on the city council. Turn it back over to you. Well, while we have that photo up, I'd like to mention Lila Hansen. She's now, she was back then Lila Ferris, but um, she, her husband died and she's since remarried. And she was uh, a, a person who, again, overcame enormous odds to run. A lot of people told her she was just too nice to run for office. And she stuck to it and she became uh, not only a city council member, she later became Isla's AA, administrative assistant. But her caring of her community, uh, especially the Robla era, or area of her district, is remarkable. She took on the whole issue of underserved uh, in, in terms of sewer service out there, and she just persisted until she, she achieved her goal. And I'll just add a little bit to that. Because I remember sitting next to her. She said I was District 1 and she was District 2. Uh, District 2 included, um, you know, North Sacramento and El Paso Heights and Robla. And I was looking at the budget and I was saying, I don't understand this. I'm looking at these numbers. It looks like you have half of the capital improvement budget. And she just looked back and said, yes, that's right. <laughs> 
And <laughs> part of it was because the, the city of North Sacramento had not done a great job with their infrastructure and the needs out there were tremendous, but the whole area needed so much in the way of road work and sewer work and water works. Um, but it was because she was so nice that the staff, I think, really responded to that and were able to help her do so much for her district. So. Right. Well, could we bring Lauren Hammond in I hope now? So. Yeah. Uh, if she she could be brought in, uh, she's another example, like Lila, uh, a woman who deeply cared about her neighborhood and her district and the entire community, and she took on really uh, daunting tasks to make improvements in her district. Lauren, can you join us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. You can. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully you can't hear the banging by the electrician. <laughs> I told them they couldn't bang between two and three. So anyway, I, I wanted to make a difference in South Sacramento and Council District 5. There's no way you can't hear that. <laughs> anyway, Council District 5 had a lot of challenges. And even though there'd been strong people before me, the need was still there. So talking to Lila the other day when we did the peace tree dedication at the Ann Rudin Peace Pond uh, the other day, I mentioned to Lila that her successor, Rob Kurth, had taken the cue from her and continued to try to monopolize the budget for all the needs in North Sacramento. And it took a couple of years, but we finally opened up the budget so that you know, some other district could get a little money for sewer and some other things. Um, let me just say, I'm very proud of the work that we did. We brought the first grocery store to Oak Park in 32 years. Then it closed a couple years ago, and now there's a new one to replace it. I am so happy that that happened. We tried to bring sidewalks. There would be streets in District 5 where the kids were literally walking in the gutter or a trench to get to school. So we took advantage of some federal dollars through transportation and walkability so that the kids could safely get to school. Those are the things that I thought were important. And then uh, one of the things that we like to do was there was a tradition in District 5 for the Oak Park neighborhood to have a concert. And it was a concert series. My first year, the committee had kind of fallen to the wayside and we couldn't afford the big acts that we used to have like Pancho Sanchez, Sarah Vaughn even came to the Oak Park concert, which was started by Callie Carney, who had been the council member in the 70s the pure joy of bringing these concerts to the neighborhood. I, I can't even explain it to you. It was so much fun. And yes, it was a bunch of people from Oak Park, but then there were people who liked the music from other neighborhoods, even outside the city, who would come to these concerts. And it just, it brought neighborhood pride, which for Oak Park in particular was extremely important. Um, I can talk about some other things, but I don't want to ramble. Great concerts, Lauren. <laughs> I enjoyed them. Yeah, I think they everyone were. still misses the music in both in South Sacramento. I think we need to bring it back. I was just talking the other day um, about the need for um, some bandstands, you know, some some platforms yes. with electricity, so we could bring some music on a regular basis uh, to both Oak Park and to the South area uh, in Meadowview, because we shouldn't only have Friday night concerts in downtown Sacramento, which I'm very proud of and I think made a huge difference in turning around downtown. But music throughout the city makes a huge difference for neighborhoods. You did a great job. I, thank you. And, and I have to agree. Sam Pinnell, uh, God rest his soul, started a Meadowview jazz concert because he wanted to rival the Oak Park concert. And then he passed and Bonnie took his place and she knew she had to continue that concert series. So between the two of us, there was music all over South Sacramento, right. if not every weekend, every other weekend. There was always something going on. Now we've had a pandemic for two years, and we're slowly but surely getting back. But I, I, I have to agree with you, Heather. <clears throat> Those concerts are missed. And 
someone ought to take up the banner. And like you said, add the stages with the electricity. And you know what else? With the shade. Yes. Because I, I know we paid to replace the shades at McClatchy Park at least once. And it's very hard for the performers with that direct hot Sacramento sun in June, July, and August. So whenever we, whenever the city builds a stage, they should always have shade. Let's remind them. <laughs> we shall. <laughs> Next project. So that uh, brings us to the whole larger issue of how women have advanced the arts. The book is divided into three main parts. It's, it's a series of vignettes. My, my goal was not to write a history, a biography of each and every woman from start to end. I think that can often, often be, sorry to say so, but boring. So I decided to organize the books in terms of uh, subject areas, like how women led and how they, what made them run and how they campaigned. Uh, the second part of the book is, is about defining uh, things that make Sacramento known for what it is. And it's one of them is, of course, the city of trees. The other is advancing the arts. Uh, Lauren and Bonnie Pinnell and, and Heather, all, all of these women made huge contributions to the arts in Sacramento. One of them is, of course, Muriel Johnson, who uh, was very, very active in terms of supporting the symphony. She uh, was a big supporter of visual arts. So there's a substantial part of the book that is devoted to what women have done to advance the arts and beautify our community and make it more livable. And of course, the, the last chapter is the one that Heather wrote that has to do with how women should prepare themselves to be leaders in the future. And would you like to talk about that just a, a bit, Heather? Well, I wanted to add a little bit, you're talking about making the city you know, more livable. And, and actually what it really does, it just makes the city more fun. And, and I used to call it the F word, but I used to use the word fun on a regular basis saying it's okay to have fun. And <laughs> the part of the city's role is to, you know, not just make things safe and healthy, but also give people a, a sense of belonging, a sense of community. Um, and part of that is to have fun and to have art in the community yeah. so that uh, it spreads throughout the community, not just in the core. Um, and I just think that's a very important thing is to try to bring people some uh, both comfort, but also a sense of whimsy and well-being to their to their ongoing lives. So, uh, whether they're children or whether they're older, and um, so it's it's a, it's an important thing to make to make our community feel comfortable and also be beautiful and also be fun. Well, I'm glad you make that point about fun because <laughs> well, possibly Sean, the next photograph might speak to this. Um, yes, indeed. Yes. Oh, now this is a you know that about Jeannie, yeah. This book is not just about women who ran for office. It's about women who helped other women run for office. And this is a, a picture of Jeannie Runyon. Every year for I think about 27 years, she got on the roof of her of her house and dressed up as like as a, as a witch as she is here. You and clarify, this was for Halloween. This for was Halloween, not a daily just for thing. Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> So Jean was a, uh, she was, I have to describe her as a maven. Yeah. She did so much to help women. She had a public relations firm and she was just uh, the most charming woman and most supportive woman uh, in, in terms of helping women get elected. Uh, there are some wonderful stories about Jeannie. She's, she's an example for all of us to remember, but this is picturing her as the Wicked Witch. <laughs> yes. And Indeed, she did so much to advance the arts as well, and you can read about that in the book. Absolutely. So do we have another photo? There she oh, so this is another, uh, the second part of the book has to do with th things that, that were, uh, are, are emblematic of Sacramento. And trees are, is, is one. This is uh, Jane Hagedorn, who helped found the Sacramento Tree Foundation. And she is, also was at the time uh, the leader of the American Lung Association Sacramento Immigrant Trails. So not only did she, uh, she was another one of these women who started in her living room with a committee. Uh, she wrote a couple of important books that address trees and how to save heritage oaks. She helped save a number of Victorian uh, homes in Sacramento. 
wrote a book about how to do that. And she also was very, very instrumental in helping to curb smoking. And she went up against the, a very, very powerful tobacco lobby and won. She, she was a woman and still is uh, very active in her community who really uh, could sort through all the details and get to the ultimate outcome. Very powerful and interesting person. And here we have Bonnie Pinnell and Heather, so it's Heather. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about Bonnie because a lot of people remember Sam Pinnell, her husband who ran for the city council before her and unfortunately passed away while he was in office. Um, Bonnie then decided to run herself and she actually, um, you know, don't tell everybody, but she did a fabulous job and I think she was a better council member and frankly a better politician than her husband was. Um, they were both very strong people, but she had enough softness around her, which Sam never got very good at softening his approach, but Bonnie was able to do that, and she was one of the most effective council members I believe we've ever had in the city of Sacramento. She represented South Sacramento and Meadowview, and um, one of my, in addition to the concerts that we mentioned earlier, one of my best um, memories of her was the time, times that we would do the economic development tours of South Sacramento. And we would put all of the other council members, all the key staff members, and as many public and developer types that we could find in a bus. And we would drive through South Sacramento. Bonnie and I sat in the front seat with the microphone. And she would point out the vacant lots that were available and who owned them and whether or not they were, how they were zoned, what they were looking for. And she pointed out the success stories as well of here we just opened this and we just opened that. Um, and it really did a lot to open people's eyes to South Sacramento and to the opportunities that were there uh, and really made a big difference in how the community was viewed, um, how African-American leaders were viewed, how women were viewed, uh, and made a big difference in, in the South area. And um, I know Lauren and I and a lot of other people still miss her because her energy um, was great. And I, she would come in to me sometimes in the office and she would have her hands on her hips and I would say, Bonnie, what's wrong? And she would say, well, you know, and she would start talking. And I'd say, well, are you mad at me? And she goes, no. And I said, why are you asking that? I said, well, look at your hands. <laughs> and she was a mother bear for her district. And I think that that's part of what, what women do is we, we take kind of ownership. We're like the moms of our districts. And um, we see what's needed. And we step up and try to fix things. And that's why we ran. And that's what we do when we're there. I think that's an excellent opportunity to segue into the uh, unique characteristics that women bring to leadership. Um, Chris writes about it very well in the book, and, and I think this would be an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. What's different about the way women lead? Heather, do you want to start well, that? I'll start, then I want to hear from Lauren on this one specifically, but I think women lead from their heart as well as their head. Um, and I think that we have a, a capacity to listen, uh, to juggle, <laughs> to multitask, if you want to call it that, but to really see how things are connected and how government can step in and help. Um, and so one time I, I met a little girl and uh, she was about four years old and her mom said, oh, this is the mayor. Do you know what a mayor is? And she just looked at me kind of sideways and said, well, yeah, that's a girl horse. <laughs> and I go, well, yes, you're right, but there's also another kind of mayor. And I said, you know, the, being the mayor is kind of like being the mom for the city. You know, we decide how we're going to spend the money and what we're going to do and that kind of thing and was able to explain it to her that way. But Lauren, what do you think? Oops. Uh oh, you're muted. Well, Sean yeah. has to unmute me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're back. You're back. <laughs> and you see, this is how women communicate. So an author once said that women weave webs. They do not climb ladders. We do succeed. We just climb the ladder differently. Our communication style is different because we're trying to bring everyone in. And each cob of the web goes out to a person that we need to talk to or we need to meet with. When we try to bring people in and agree with our idea or convince them how important a policy issue is and how we can address it. And it tends to be less um, intimidating. It doesn't mean that we can't 
put our hands on our hips like Bonnie used to when we need to. But that's like the, the last weapon to be used. And women do have to use it occasionally because just like Mayor Rudin, the guy's expecting her to make coffee. Uh, no, we're going to talk about this $32 million project and what does my district get out of it? What does the city get out of it? But first we have to talk. And I think that's what's so important about women. And I think we have to remember that we can succeed and we don't have to do like the men do to succeed. Does that sound right? Absolutely. Well, and that leads to um, another point that both Heather and Lauren can address, and Chris as well. In the book, Chris talks quite eloquently about how the League of Women Voters assisted women in coming up and being comfortable in leadership positions, but not everybody took that path. And Heather and Lauren and Chris are all here to, to talk about other paths so that, you know, the women who are listening and the young women who are ready to move into leadership positions know that there are many routes and paths to that to that place. Lauren, you want to start us off? Your path was different. Well, it, it was, but it wasn't. I ran for office when throughout school, honestly. And then when I graduated from college, um, I got a job downtown. Actually, I got a job at the Sacramento Bee. That was my first job out of college. I wound up being the shop steward when the Sacramento Bee went on strike. That was a lot to learn for a very young person, but I did. Eventually, I started working at the California State Senate, and that was very interesting because I wasn't a legislative aide that dealt with legislation. I worked for the Senate Rules Committee, so we do all the things that make the Senate work. And I had to learn to temper um, my replies, how let's put it that way, because you had a lot of staff people who think they are as, as important as their elected member. And I was in this unique position where I would have to explain to them that, no, that's not always the way it is. And while I did this job, I still had all the things I like to do. I've always been politically active. I helped start two African-American Democratic clubs. And then I went on to the CSUS, my alma mater, their alumni board. And then my mentor, Isla Collin, knew that I was active and put me on a health advisory committee. From there, there was an opening on the County Planning Commission. And although I thought that Grantland Johnson, the late Grantland Johnson was gonna appoint me to that, he had to appoint a man. We won't even go there. Isla, who kept telling me, you've got the fire in the belly, you need to do this, appointed me to the County Project Planning Commission. And I had no idea that that was gonna lead me to run for office. I really had no idea, but it was fortuitous and it worked. Now, if you want me to explain the rest of it, I'll just tell you quickly. When I announced that I was going to run to succeed Deborah Ortiz, Deborah Ortiz had already picked someone to replace her. And because I was on the County Project Planning Commission, I already knew all of the developers. And they'd already been working with me for three years. So I couldn't be ignored. And once Councilmember Sam Pinnell formally endorsed me, things took off. And because women weave webs, I, I won that election. And my opponent and I remained friends. We became friends on the campaign trail. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> I just had lunch with her a little bit a few months ago. <laughs> I love that. How about you, Heather? You're... Well, one thing I just want to mention is I know that, that for Ann Rudin in particular, the League of Women Voters was a tremendous opportunity uh, because she not only was the leader of the local chapter of the of the League of Women Voters, and which in that particular organization they they don't work with candidates 
they work on issues and on policy discussions and they do a lot of research and they they come to understand what policy can do both for good and, and for bad. Uh, but as a leader locally, she learned also then the leadership skills that it takes to work with people and with the group. She went on to become the, the statewide president of the League of Women Voters. So she was in charge of all of the organizations in California, and that was before she ran for mayor. So um, and it's probably one of those organizations that, pro that the men probably didn't know much about. Certainly they weren't active members for the most part, although men can join. Um, and so I think they, they underestimated her because they didn't realize what she came with, the knowledge base she came with, both in terms of the policies and the issues, um, as well as how to work with people as a leader. Um, the way I came up is I moved from um, Davis, where I went to college, to Sacramento uh, and, and bought my first home because I couldn't afford Davis, but I could afford South Natomas. That's where I bought my house. Um, I got involved in helping to form a neighborhood association, which we all thought was just going to be social. Uh, and within a couple of years, uh, we were testifying on an almost weekly basis in front of city council, uh, opposing the land use changes that the city was making, and frankly, the lack of investment in our community because we were one of the first post Prop 13 communities, which some of you know what that means. That was when the uh, property tax uh, shift happened and people as individuals started paying less in property tax, which meant that the cities and counties of Sacramento had less revenue to spend on the things that the citizens were demanding they do without the money. So uh, we were one of those communities, you know, I had read the plan and it had bike trails, it had parks, it had a library, it had a fire station. None of those things happened. We couldn't even get stop signs or traffic signals. And we ultimately sued the city of Sacramento and we won. Um, and so, it, my path was very different. It was very much as a grassroots organizer and as an advocate on behalf of my community. Uh, and I ran in part because I was just plain angry. I was upset that our community was not being respected and provided the same services as other communities in Sacramento. And so that was my path to running. Um, and because I had been so active for so long, I, I had a, a presence. People knew who I was. I had name recognition already. Um, and so that's, that's kind of um, how I came into office. And then I had not planned on running for mayor, but I hadn't planned on Joe Cerna passing away in office. And when I looked around at all the men that were throwing their hats in the ring, I thought, you know, I've been here the longest. I've been actively involved in the city more than anybody who's running. So maybe it's, I should do this too. And I did, and I won that. Hallelujah. And Chris, you're a... Though you didn't take office, you certainly were involved with the women that you write about. And how did you get to that place in your life? Well, it's another Proposition 13 story, really. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, <laughs> yeah, I, I had graduated from Sac State with the highly useful degree of a master's degree in art with a concentration in printmaking. And back then, before Proposition 13 passed, uh, I had the aspiration to be a teacher. And I finally landed a job at Sacramento City College a part-time job, then Proposition 13 passed, and I was expendable. They took my job, my class away, and gave it to a white male tenured teacher. I gave up the idea of teaching at that point, and I pivoted, which is what so many women in this book have done. I decided that another thing that's highly important to me was the environment. I became active in the Environmental Council of Sacramento, became their spokesperson, and then I, I ended up on the Sacramento City Planning Commission. Uh, so that became my passion, but you know, like so many women that are covered in the book, I in no way expected to be an activist in Sacramento. Uh, my, my plans were totally upended when something out of my control happened, and I pivoted and took the opportunity to uh, take on new, new, new challenges. And I think that Lauren could also add to that the idea of pivoting. Lauren? So you're talking about pivoting? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to. You have to be a good dancer to do this, whether it's running for office or being politically active or being successful. 
I was thinking earlier about who are the women in my life that, you know, I really looked up to. And of course, there's my mom and my grandmother. But then there are other people. I was walking through the garage at the state capitol. And uh, back then, you know, we had a, a system for listening to the legislative committees. And then assembly member Maxine Waters was chair of the Ways, Ways and Means Committee for the assembly. And someone had made some proposal. She lit into them. And I have to say, she did it. She was so sophisticated and she had so much passion. I thought, okay, you know, I think I want to do that, honestly. And then let me just put this in here now. When I did run, when I finally decided to run for office in the city council, I have to thank the Honorable Kim Muir because I had been a volunteer in at least 20 to 30 campaigns from the time I graduated from college until I ran. But I didn't know how to be a candidate. And she really showed me how to be an effective candidate and to be disciplined. So when you see the book and her holding those shoes, the most important thing about the shoes is you have to walk. And if you don't walk, you better have some other form of communication that replaces that. But there's nothing like the door to door contact. But what was equally important was being on the phone, talking to people and convincing them to give you money. Kim taught me that. That's a very important point that maybe Heather and Lauren can talk about a bit in leader in seeking leadership, that it isn't typical for women to feel comfortable asking for money but because well, it is so for themselves right but because it's so essential how did you make that transition so that you could do it as effectively as you did well i think part of it is uh, people need to remember that most women most most campaigns are organized and run by women um, most of the effort of you know and it used to be Folding letters and licking stamps were done by women. Um, a lot of the precinct walking is done by women. Most of the phone banking is done by women. But for, and, and even in the fundraising that people do, whether it's for their local PTA or their local environmental group, most of that is done by women. Um, but, but they don't, but women don't necessarily see themselves as the candidates. And so we're used to asking for money for other things. We're used to asking people to volunteer for an effort, to show up at an event, to, to give money to a cause. Shifting that into asking money for yourself, you need, what I had to do was kind of put it in context of this money isn't for me. This money is so I can represent you on the council. This money is so that I can do the things that we both care about. And so it still had to be kind of cause-based for me because it really wasn't about, you know, how many brochures can I get done with, with my face on it? It was about how do I get the votes so that I can make the decisions that after sitting in the audience so many years, I just started thinking, you know, maybe if I was sitting in one of those chairs, I could have more impact than sitting in one of these chairs and giving my three minutes of testimony, which by the way is down to two minutes. Um, which I disagree with, but um, but anyway, that's you just have to figure out a way to do it, and you have to believe enough in yourself and visualize yourself in that position of being in that chair uh, that this is something you have to do. I mean, I wish there wasn't so much money in politics. Um, I especially now detest the whole independent expenditure stuff and the fact that we treat corporations like they're people. There's a lot wrong with politics. There's a lot wrong with the campaign system. Um, but it still is the system we have to use if we want to sit in one of those chairs and may have the impacts that we're able to have. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Heather completely. And in my first campaign, because that's the campaign where I got all these lessons. You keep having lessons, but, you know, the first one is a whole lot. My uh, campaign consultant was Phil Gerizzo, and he was the guy that could get the person you never expect elected. So he was a top tier guy, but he didn't always get along with all the other Democratic consultants. His chief of staff, his, his business partner was Nancy Mooney. And when I would be calling in the morning, 
they would come check on me because, you know, I like to talk, I like to listen, and then I'd get around to asking for money. So one day she wrote him a note telling him that I was taking too long on the calls. He comes in, he puts the note in his mouth and eats it. Okay. Is that the best lesson for a woman? No. But did I get it? Yes. And that was when he, <laughs> that was when he called Kim Mueller. And then Kim Mueller then called me and then we went out for coffee so that she could explain how it's supposed to go. And I did get much better at it because when you're calling these folks and well, I knew some of them, but I didn't know all of them. Uh, there's one person I'm going to leave him unnamed. We will just say that he still lives here in town and he was a former elected official. We'll leave it at that. He told me that my opponent called him four times to beg for money, whereas I'd only called twice. I said, okay, well, then I'll call you again tonight, and I'll call you in the morning, and then will you give me what I need? Which, when I ran it, $100 was the maximum that you could give to an election. It was in between some campaign reforms that the city of Sacramento went through, and I was stuck at the 100 level. So I started way behind. And I was in a special election, but in February, Black History Month, yay, all of a sudden I started catching up and my opponent was not raising any more money. She had already peaked where I, as I was still going up. And then Sam Pinnell decided, okay, well, I've endorsed her. It looks like she could maybe win. Maybe I'll start making some phone calls and, and Sam would do things in bunches. He'd have days where he wasn't doing anything and then he'd have, up, but then he had health issues. Then there were other days when you couldn't get him off the phone. He was doing all kinds of stuff and the money started coming up. And I will tell you, we had to mail according to how much money I raised. So instead of doing, as they say in Camp A parlance, a run of brochures of uh, say 5,000, 10,000, it's usually in groups of thousands. We had to cut it short because I didn't have enough money to pay for it. And my consultant let me know he didn't carry over expenses. And I told him, yeah, and I don't like to be in debt. So let's do whatever we can do. And we had to do that almost to the end. But in the end, I did get the money raised. I did win. I was in some debt. And then, of course, Kim Mueller and her husband, Bob Sloby, said, we're going to have a fundraiser for you at our house and give all the people that didn't support you the opportunity to congratulate you. Another key political lesson that I learned. That's excellent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chris, there's um, we're getting closer to the end. I would certainly want to give you an opportunity to talk about where the book is available and uh, how people can get their copies. Yes, I meant to bring this up earlier, but now is the opportunity. I underestimated the need for books when we did our first printing. The Sacramento High Street Press, associated with the Sacramento Library, printed the first 50 books, of which 20 went to all of the libraries in Sacramento. So you can go to any of your branch libraries and check this book out. I also then distributed the ones, the extras, the other 30, to uh, women who contributed to the book and also to the following bookstores. Uh, however, those bookstores have also run out, <laughs> which I guess is a good thing. The bookstores that are happy to have the book as soon as I can resupply them are time-tested books, Spears Books, Avid Reader on Broadway, East Village Bookshop, I believe the Sacramento History Museum, in fact, does have some books on hand, as well as the um, Warehouse Creative, which uh, has agreed to handle the book. Uh, and then by uh, mid to late March, they, the book should be available to order online. I have switched to a different printer. I'm not as happy with that, the quality of that printing, but uh, it will be available, therefore, through all of the mainstream sources 
like uh, Barnes and Noble and, and, and Amazon. So in a couple of weeks, it'll be widely available. I'm sorry I ran out. <laughs> But uh, yes, I'm hoping to have this book more widely available. And uh, on that point, uh, I want to reiterate that this book is not just a trip down memory lane. This book is oriented toward young women coming up. It's important for them to know on whose shoulders they stand and understand uh, that their, their, their contributions are looked forward to and that they should get involved and and become the next group of Sacramento leaders. So again, thank you all for participating. Do you want to add anything, Heather? Well, I was just going to add, I think that sometimes uh, in these days where we do see a lot more women engaged in all kinds of professions, um, people may not realize that we're only on the 14th elected woman in the city of Sacramento's history. Uh, Mai Vang, who was elected less than two years ago, uh, became number 14. Um, I was number seven, Ann Rudin was number three. So we don't, have, and there have only been six members of the Board of Supervisors who have been women. Uh, and Sacramento is the oldest city in the state of California, and for us to only have 14 leaves a lot of room for future women to run for office. And I just want to encourage the women who are out there uh, who are listening to, to give it some thought and to uh, think about whether they might want to run for office someday. Uh, but there's all kinds of ways to be involved in politics beyond see, being in, in the office. You can also work on campaigns, and this is an election year. I think our democracy is at risk, and I want women to help save the day, as we often have. Um, so there's lots of ways. Voting, helping other people vote, volunteering on campaigns, running for office yourself. Or writing a book. And, <laughs> well, and both Heather and, and Lauren are very actively involved in organizations that are excellent not only excellent places to start, but also can be uh, appreciated by Chris and the rest of us involved in the book because they helped fund the purchase of many of the books. So the National Women's Political Caucus, the Capital Women's Campaign, uh, we're very grateful. Thank you very much. If, if I could just say one thing quickly. For me, I could not have been successful without the wonderful staff that I had the support of my family and friends, but most of my staff were women and we had countless interns. I will tell you that there, are, there were many constituents who preferred my staff over me. I just kept getting reelected because I had such wonderful staff and I just had to acknowledge them. Chris, you have an opportunity here to add something that we may have forgotten? What would... well, I just encourage you to, to buy the book, ch check it out for, of your library. As I say, I think it is currently available at the History Museum. And share it with your, your daughters and your granddaughters. We need to have young women be as invested in Sacramento as this group of women that is in We Can Do This. And, and thank you again for your, your attention and, again, my pleasure. Thanks to the Asian Community Center for hosting this event for us. We really appreciate your willingness to reach out on all of our behalfs um, to, to put on this program. So thank you for that opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you all very much.